Hello, and welcome to the Open Virtual Film Project. This is part 3F of my Unreal Skills for Film series and covers exporting from Blender to Unreal in the second workflow, Assets. This workflow can be used to create kit bash components similar to the marketplace contents we were working with earlier in the series and generally creates a library of objects to pull from in order to create your scenes. Once something has become an asset, there are a few best practices I will be going over in this video since they need to be more stable than your scenes we were importing earlier. When you turn over to stage of VFX, someone might need to make everything you're seeing into an asset in order to dovetail with their pipelines, especially on very large productions using LED walls. In this video, I will be going over two cases, importing a group of objects to add to your library and importing a more complex object into your library that can then be turned into a blueprint. This video assumes you have watched the previous video on importing scenes into Unreal Engine. Links for the remainder of the series as well as deep dive videos on the various tools shown are in the description. In the tool series, you'll find advanced features for each of the 3D modeling softwares to Unreal Bridges. These tutorials are done in 4.26, however, they've been tested in 4.27 and 5 early access. And when a difference between engine versions show up, I will note it in the video. With that out of the way, let's jump back into Blender. In this model, I have a few pieces of molding that I want to bring into Unreal Engine that match up with those walls that I was bashing earlier, as well as this call that we'll talk about in the second half of this video. In this workflow, I want to pay a bit more attention to the details of the piece I am creating to make it as useful and forward compatible as possible. The first thing I want to consider is the name of each of the pieces of geometry and what folder they will go into. In the OVFB toolbar, you can see if I switched the import type to asset and started filling out information. It is a static mesh import. I'm calling the import ground trim from EPM class man, a short name for the Epic Marketplace Classic Mansion set I was using in the previous tutorials and dropped in my initials as well. The last section of this is the asset category. In this case, I chose to place this asset in the folder assets arc walls inside of Unreal Engine. If your project needs a different arrangement of folders, they could be modified in edit, preferences, add-ons, bridge. And there's this asset categories field here. Just separate each subfolder with a forward slash and the different sections with a comma. So you can see I have arc slash bridge, comma, arc slash buildings all the way to comma vehicles. And that's what shows up in this drop down here. If I'm in Unreal 5, I can choose whether or not to use Nanite with this asset. Again, with the same caveats of card-based foliage that I talked about in the last video. Next, when considering origin points, I want to be very logical in their placement. In the case of this molding, I want it to work out of the box with the classic mention walls that I had added in the scene earlier. So I have one of those walls exported from Blender and brought into my scene with its pivot at 0, 0, 0 and no transforms applied to it. I then modeled out a few pieces of molding I needed for the scene to place on the wall, a straight section, and an outside corner section. I made sure to set the pivot point of my molding to the same location, scale, and rotation as the wall. In this case, it's super easy since the wall is at 0, 0, 0, and I molded these in place. If I select them, hit Control a this gives us the ability to apply transforms, and I'm going to apply all transforms on those meshes. A few other examples of pivot point locations are that every door should have its pivot centered on the hinge, and plants should have their pivot point bottom center or wherever they hit the ground. If I ever make an updated version of this asset, say I do a texture pass on top of it, I want to make sure the pivot location stays the same. This is one reason that I've modeled these at 0, 0, 0. That way it is super easy to keep the pivot point in the same location. And the pivot point staying in the same location ensures that if I use this in my scene and update importing it, that it will drop into existing locations without a hitch. Since I'm working with molding, I have also created a second version of the same molding, and I went through the same process of putting the pivot point in the same location. One of the advantages to having both sets of molding with the same pivot point is I can swap between crown 01 and crown 02 without moving the meshes. So instead of Unreal, I could drag crown 02 onto crown 01 in the details panel and be able to replace it one-to-one -one without a problem. And if I were to add a crown 03, I could do the same thing. For names, be sure to add a number into the name field in case you want to add another version of the same asset in the folder later. In this case, crown 01, crown 02, I could make crown 03. Also make sure to keep the name short yet descriptive. If you're working on a large pipeline that needs you to track assets by unique ID code, this is where you would add the code and update your documentation. After I'm happy with the names of the meshes, I would do the same with materials and textures as shown in the last video, and then run the naming convention commands. So I have my objects, mesh naming convention, material naming convention, texture naming convention, which just removes any illegal characters from the texture names. With the assets pivoted and named, we can now look at UV maps and how to deal with them. Most of the time, so long as the texture that is projected to the object looks good, that is as far as you have to take it, as UV maps will usually be redone in post when they make higher res versions of the assets. Perfect UVs are often a waste of time until something is being used for final pixel or approaching its final version, and even then, they're not always needed. 
if you know something's going to be redone multiple times, is going to slow the iterative process. So early on when you're doing look dev for a project, rougher UVs are good, and when you come to final stage production, you tighten your UVs. If you need to work on an LED stage, you will sometimes run into situations where you need cleaner UV maps, especially if the lighting needs to be baked into the set for performance reasons. If this is the case, you want to make sure your UV maps are one-to-one, -one, cover as much of the UV space as possible, have a good textile density, no overlapping islands, UDIMs are set up correctly, and the textures are baked down as needed. Getting that level of fidelity is outside the scope of this video. However, this is often done as a pass over the top of an existing asset, so we're going to work with what we have right now, and I will make a UV deep dive video later. If UVs are not your thing, and you need to get something done quickly, inside of Blender, select your object, go into edit mode, select everything, and then if you hit the UV key, you can do a cube projection. Coming into my UV editing tab, it created a couple of sections for my UV that I could then deal with inside of Unreal, with this top section being the front face of the object. So if I'm looking at it from this direction, this top section is that view, and this being the top face of my object coming down from the top projecting. This is often more than enough for early previous work, and as you go down the line, it will get more complicated. I had set up better UVs, so I'm going to jump into that now. With all of that done, we can export for Unreal. So coming into the export section, since this import is just pieces of geometry that do not need to be used as an assembled unit, we might consider clicking the no ASH ASB checkbox. This will leave our import folder a bit cleaner. Show you what that means when we get into Unreal and click the export selection for Unreal and send export to Unreal. If I go into that same UE mirror folder as before, you can see it's now under assets, architecture, walls, name of the asset, date. Instead of Unreal, you can see the files were imported into the assets folder instead of the environments folder in that folder path we were working with earlier, and that blue ASB and ASH file are missing. So I can start bringing objects into my scene. I can grab Crowd02. See, so yeah, I've got my ground molding piece out into the scene, and I could take it, line it up with the wall as necessary. However, instead of placing it manually, since I set it up to work with these walls, I'm going to use these walls as a reference. If making sure my molding is on the same level as my wall section here, I can take that crown piece drag and drop it on top of my wall piece, and then in the details panel, see how it transforms out. Now see it lines up perfectly. I could do this with any of the wall sections that I wanted to. As I was saying before, I could, if I wanted to switch out this wall section for a different wall section, drag and drop this crown 01 on top of the static mesh field, and now I've got a different molding profile. And if I duplicate the object with Control w I could put in one of those corner pieces as well. With how I set this up, if I wanted this corner over there, I could duplicate it, come into the scale, and set its X scale to negative 1. Now you see I have a corner on both sides of this piece of molding. Bit weird in the center of the wall. However, if I were to take this object, slide it all the way down to this corner here, you see I now have molding going around a corner. If I go back to Unreal, make any edits, export, send to export, or import using the OVFP menu import export function, it would overwrite on top of this, leaving any material changes that I had done in Unreal, and just updating the meshes. If I had updated the complexity of this mesh, it would automatically bring that new complexity into my scene. So this way with assets, I can rapidly iterate the look of my scene, constantly making it better and better. This is why we had all of those best practices. In that same process, I want to make sure if I'm importing the same asset, the same scene, all of the pieces of that asset, so crown molding 01 and crown molding 02 are never deleted, so that when I re-import and it overwrites, it does not delete them. Now onto a slightly more complex example. I have this skull object inside of Blender that has been broken apart into several pieces. If you look into the details panel, you will see that the jaw section is parented to the top of the skull. This will allow me to do fun things inside of UE, like moving around the skull while opening and closing the jaw. Later I will add more pieces to this object as I refine it. I already did all of the prep work for this mesh, so let's export and send it to Unreal, this time making sure to leave the no ASH ASB box unticked. Now inside an empty scene inside of Unreal, I have the ASB brought out into the scene at 000. I'm going to click the rebuild hierarchy to create my skull out in the scene, and then with the ASB selected, I can click the create blueprint and content folder, and you see it will have created a blueprint object of my skull and spawn that out into the scene. So you see BP, FPC, Will of the Wisp, is now an object in the scene. And I can drag this out into the scene assembled. This creates a more compact version of the skull in the content browser with all of the functionalities of Blueprint, like running code. So I can make it wiggle a bit and open close its jaws it pops. We will cover how to get this functionality in the effects part of the tutorial series. I'm using a timeline as a quick hack, but for now, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.